Hi everyone and welcome to uh, Smart Forum Building, Forum Building 102. I will be your host today, MJ Nascota, and your presenter today will be Barry Johannesson. Um, just a couple upcoming events with iForm Builder. First, we have our March certification. Um, if you're looking for a very intuitive class to learn the iForm Builder platform, um, it's pretty much one-on-one. -on -one, um, projects are done. You'll be assigned homework from Barrett to really dive into the platform and make sure you have a good understanding of it. Um, we've done a couple of them now. A lot of good success. A lot of great comments of people that have taken them. So, I mean, if you're looking to really learn the platform, I highly suggest clicking on the link there and learning more about it. Um, also coming up in May is our Power User Summit. Um, we did our first one last year. Essentially what we did is um, a lot of our users are taking iPhone Builder to the next level. I mean, it's, it's not simply data collection anymore. It's what can we do with the data past that. So a lot of different types of reporting they're using it for, um, dashboarding, how they're getting into their backend systems, and really um, evolving iPhone Builder. So if you're interested in coming, it is free to attend. So um, May 11th, 2016, it'll be here in Reston, Virginia. Um, I would highly suggest if you do have the time to come check it out. All right, MJ, uh, thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you for all of those who have taken time out of your schedule to join us for today's webinar. If this is your first time attending a webinar, like MJ said, we are going to send over uh, the recording. We'll send over uh, the slides. But I'm also going to include a form package. Now, in that form package, it's going to go through some of the form that I'm, I've built out for you today. And you can import that into your account, and you'll be able to uh, use that as a resource and a reference when building your form and creating uh, smart forms uh, for your own projects. Let's go ahead and jump in and talk about today's session and what you can expect. Uh, the first thing that we're going to go through is the iForm Builder support. Now, I know that seems a little silly to talk about, but I just want to make sure that you realize that we are here for you and the different outlets that you have to contact us uh, within with an iForm Builder. Uh, the next thing we'll talk about is just what are smart forms. And then we'll go into some best practices for form building. We'll do a quick form demo. And with that form demo, I've already built out some of the functionality because I want to kind of show you really the power behind having a form that has smart controls in it. And then we'll break it down and go into how to actually add those to your form. So. Here is our different support options. The first one is our customer su success center. And I hope that you've all have gone in there and you've logged in and you've created an account. When, if you haven't done that, um, you can, when you get this PDF, you'll be able to click on this link and it'll launch our customer success center. But you'll notice there isn't an obvious sign up button for our, cent our customer success center. So if you do wanna be a part of this community, which again, I suggest that you, you uh, do uh, become a member. All you have to do is click where it says sign in and at the bottom there's a sign up button. This is where you can create your own account here in our support tool. The reason I would suggest doing this is because then you can follow help desk articles. You can track your activities. If you submit a request you'll be able to see what is going on with that request and if the agent is currently working on it or if it's already been solved. We also have our release notes in our customer success center. I urge you to go in there and once, once you are in the release notes section, you can actually choose to follow uh, the release notes. And by doing so, by just clicking that button that says follow in that corner, every single time a new release happens within iForm Builder, you'll receive an email notifying you that uh, that a release is coming up in the next couple of weeks and I'll tell you exactly what that release is and how it could impact your project. So that's really uh, helpful if you are the one uh, managing the project, especially if there's a, a new feature that you were looking forward to and we may have added it in the release. Next, we have iForm Builder training. So not only do we have these uh, training webinars, but if you have a dedicated database, uh, or if you're thinking about upgrading to a dedicated database, we do offer our Kickstart training program, and that's four hours that are devoted to you and your team to get you up to, to speed with using the platform, as well as uh, making sure that your project is deployed with best practices. Not only do we have the Kickstart training program, but we also offer on-site uh, training if, you, if that's something that you're interested in, as well as online. So just contact me if you're uh, looking to have uh, company-wide training on the iForm Builder platform. We have our community forum. 
And I'm not going to go in there now, but uh, what I want to note there is we have a community forum discussion that's add new ideas. And if you go in there and you post your idea, that's actually where we get all of our new features or new um, uh, the counter widget and the timer widget. Those were all requests that came through the community forum. They got so many upvotes that we added it to the platform. That's the same with the annotation feature that we've added a couple of years back. If you're interested in receiving support on your project, we have project services. So we could either build out some of your forms or help you build a custom workflow. Our live webinars, you guys already know about that. Um, on our webinar page, if you didn't know, we also have a list of all the past webinars and the recordings of those webinars. So after today's session, if you want to see what you may have missed, go check those out. And when you have a car ride, or if you're looking on a specific concept, then just go listen to some of those webinars. Our The last one that we had, our special topics webinar, was with uh, customers coming and presenting on their API solutions. So if you're a developer and you want to learn what groups have been doing with the API, I urge you to go take a listen to that. And the last support thing that I have here is just the certification, which MJ already spoke about. We do offer this a couple times throughout the year. Our next one is coming up in March in two weeks from now. And uh, that's based on uh, hoping to support our Australia and our later time zones. And so uh, I'll be doing that in Eastern Standard Time. It's from 7 to 11 at night. But um, for those of you over the sea uh, and everything like that, then it's a little bit uh, better time for you. All right, now let's go into this. So what are smart forms? Really, how can, how can you define what a smart form is? So a smart form eliminates error. It eliminates that process of data cleansing. So no longer will you have to go back and view that Excel file and edit users' responses. When you have smart forms, then you don't have to worry about that because you're already getting the data that you need and want. Um, you'll use widgets like option list or range or the counter instead of using free text. So you, in your form, if you have a smart form, you're going to have very little areas that are actually allowing the user to type in text unless it's describing something. Um, so this, by doing that, then you're getting the response that you need and then you can quantify that response. So if you're using like a dashboard tool or um, if you're just basically compiling all your data and you're uh, summarizing it later on. When you're using option lists or, or some of those other input types, it's much easier to quantify than if you just had free text. Another thing that smart forms have is they include descriptions in the fields uh, that have longer questions. So in just a minute, when we go into the form builder, I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about for those descriptions. Um, they are extremely valuable and sometimes overlooked by form builders, uh, but they, they really help the end user and it really helps the person looking at the data because the user has all the information they need to, to answer that question uh, correctly when it is a, a text-based question. Smart forms also uh, use masks and um, default fields so that the, the user doesn't have to put in something that's always constant. Uh, you can also, smart forms will also pass data from one field to the next instead of having the user uh, fill that in. It'll pre-populate form fields as well. So these smart forms, it's not just adding JavaScript or smart controls, but it's really making a unique experience for the user and allows you to get what you need out, out of the data. So let's start with some of our form building best practices. And here are our initial project considerations. So if you're brand new to form building, hopefully you've started to go through this process already. And if you've been building forms for a while, I'm sure some of this you already know, but it's always good to review just in case. The first project consideration that I have here is just what devices will the end users have access to? So as I'm sure you know, uh, iForm Builder is available or the iForm app is available on both iOS and Android devices, which is great. But the user experience on both of those devices can differ slightly. Uh, we are trying to make it so that they are extremely, uh, or so that they have the same functions on both Android and iOS, and for the most part they do, but there are some input types that we offer 
that uh, are only currently available on iOS and not Android. So things like the timer widget, which just came out, that's only on iOS. So it's important that you're taking that into consideration when you're building out your forms. The next is what naming conventions do you use for your form and your option list? Not only will naming conventions truly help the uh, organization of your form builder account, but they'll also make it much easier if you're going to have multiple form builders in your account. Uh, so you can kind of identify who's building what and what forms go together, as well as uh, what, if you're having a, a form with a subform, you'll, you're able to identify uh, what is the top level. The next uh, initial project consideration that I have is just how do you structure the form? You know, a lot of times we, we are given these paper forms and what we have to do is take that paper form and put it in this mobile data concept. So no, you're not just putting in the exact kind of questions that you had in that paper form, you're instead enhancing the project and uh, making it so that uh, if, if the paper form had the same question 10 times, you only want to have that once and maybe you'll pass that data to all those other fields so that it meets that criteria of having it in uh, that response 10 times, but the user doesn't have to put it in 10 times. So it's thinking about that structure. Um, you can also think about how are you going to uh, split up into the different subforms. So if your project is, the paper project is 10 pages, how are you going to make it so that you don't have all 10 page question, 10, the 10 pages of questions on one level of forms? So where can you break it into different categories with the subforms? The next is just what element input types do you use for each question? So like I said just a minute ago, with when you're creating smart forms, you want to use the element input type that's going to give you the data that you need. And, and so that's where it's very, uh, very important to be cognizant of all the different input types that we have available within iForm Builder so that you are getting the best data. And the last thing here, and the one that we're really looking at today, is where can I add form functionality, so these smart controls, to, to cut down on human error and input? So one of the initial considerations that I have was to use a naming convention. Um, now this is when you're first building your form, when you just get started, in the edit form property section, you'll notice there's a place that says form label as well as table name. Now that form label is what the user is going to see on the device, so that can be whatever you want. It's the table name that you want to try to configure and change so that it follows a naming convention. Uh, the naming convention that I use is uh, I, I want all of the forms that go together to start exactly the same. So in this example on my screen right now, you'll notice it says parent underscore form underscore name. And it's that way for both of those forms. At the end of the, the parent form, I have underscore P so that I know that that's the top layer. After, on, on the second example that I have here, I have, un, after it says name, I have underscore subform name underscore C. So a lot of times what I'll do is after I put in the parent form name, I do some quick description of what the subform's about and then do underscore C. So I know that that is a subform um, attached to that top level. So that naming convention is done in the table name and all you have to do is uncheck the box that says based on label so that you can change that. You'll notice in my screenshot on the left hand or on the right hand side, sorry about that. Um, I've given a quick screenshot on how uh, it's so helpful to have that naming convention because then you'll see all those forms connected in the same area. I mentioned earlier building for the device type. So building for if your users are uh, have access to an Android device or if they have an access to an iOS device. If they're going to be using both, there's also th some things that you can add to your, your form so that um, if it's an iOS user, they may see the drawing widget with annotation, but if it's an Android user, then they just see the image uh, widget where they can take the picture. Besides just build, building for those different uh, device types, you also want to build for the smallest device. And this is extremely important when it comes to iOS devices. So when you're building a form on iOS devices and you have 
a select option list and that's where you can see the little buttons on the form when you're using the select option list you want to limit how many uh, how much text is in each one of those options because if you have too much text in there on those smaller devices it'll actually cut off some of that text so the user won't be able to read what those options are which doesn't help your da data at all so you'll want to make sure that you're always testing on the smallest device that the user is going to have access to. Another best practices that we have here is just to make sure you have a device handy while you're building your forms. And with that, uh, I actually think that it's helpful to have more than one device. The reason being, and this actually happened to a current um, individual who's going through the certification program right now, but sometimes what will happen is a device will actually cache and it won't be uh, downloading the most current version of the form or it won't be functioning the way it's, it's supposed to. And sometimes you even have to uninstall the app and then reinstall for it to work properly. So if you have two devices, then you're able to test to see if they're both working the same way and to see if what you've created is actually uh, with the JavaScript is actually working properly. The second best practice that I have here is to open multiple browser windows to eliminate error, error when you're copying data column names. If you're brand new to uh, building smart forms, then you may not have even thought about co copying data column names. But when we get into the, uh, the weeds here in just a minute, uh, every smart control that you're doing, you're going to have to use a fields data column name. When it comes to doing more advanced uh, smart controls, whether you're using our smart table search, or maybe you want to pass data from a subform to a parent form or vice versa, then you're going to have to use that data column name. If you were to only have one window open when you're trying to copy that information, you could actually end up, um, if you're trying to type it in, uh, you could end up having some mistakes, which then could cause your form to not work properly. So to try to eliminate some of that, uh, that error, that simple error, I always have multiple browser windows open. Barry? Yep. Um, we had a question come in. And, um, I mean, it's, it's, I'm going to do another question off of it as well. Um, how many characters can we use to name our forms? And add on to that, um, what would be some best practices for naming your forms? So great questions. Um, as far as the first one, how many characters? I believe it's around it's hmm, I, have, I don't know the exact number I believe it's it's around between 35 and 50 that is the maximum but we can definitely get back to you there um, and when you're typing in your uh, table name you'll actually run into a problem where it'll tell you that your name is too long and you won't be able to save it so you'll definitely be notified uh, about that as far as naming conventions and uh, what a uh, best practice is what I try to do is not only do I try to have it so that I have an idea of what that form's about uh, with that table name, but I'll even have it so that whoever's creating the form, if it's myself, then I'll start that table name with my uh, first name. So let me just jump out of here and show you uh, what it looks like in my current account. You'll see that I have all of these forms with Barrett, uh, and I also have it, uh, let's see, we have Barrett Session 2 Feb Demo Ag C. So uh, Barrett uh, Session 2 was the parent form name. Actually, Barrett Session 2 Feb Demo was the parent form name. Um, so I have underscore P there. And then the subform is just right after that with underscore ag. So I know that's for the, aggr um, the aggregation that I was using for that form. And then underscore C for the subform. I also had a smart table lookup for that, that process and in that form. And we, when you're doing smart table lookup, you need to have a database form. And so I always name mine underscore DB so that I remember that that is what that uh, specific form was designed for and used for. Uh, hey, Barrett, just, uh, just checked on it. Um, on the label name itself, it looks like you can go pretty high, probably close to 100 on that. But on the table name itself, it does have a 50 character limit. Okay. Thank you so much, MJ. No problem. Are there any other questions coming in about that? Um, at the moment, no, there's not. All right, then I'll continue. But thank you, MJ. And, and anyone else, whenever you have questions, please remember to just, just put them in the chat, and we're ready to help. 
so uh, some of these best practices, um, as a reminder, I guess, or if you have if you haven't really built many forms yet, then you you'll probably stumble upon this. But every single form that you create is automatically assigned to your username. Now that's great for testing, but when you have that parent and child relationship, you when you're assigning forms, you only are, need to assign the parent form and the user's not going to see the sub form on their device. So you may wanna go back and go under form assignment and then uncheck all the boxes for collect rights for the sub forms that you've created so that your, uh, your, actually, your, home, your iForm home menu page doesn't get too cluttered. Another thing that I wanna talk about with that uh, form assignment is Later on, I mentioned uh, I'm going to be sending over a form package for the project that I'm showing off today. And with that, when you import that, all the forms that you're importing are automatically also automatically going to be assigned to your username as well. So at that point, you'll want to go in and unassign some of those subforms and only have the parent form assigned to your username to have access to it in the iForm home uh, page. Now, continuing some more, another best practice here is to limit the amount of elements on your parent form. The reason we suggest doing that and breaking your form into subforms instead is because of the upload and download speed for the user. It's, even if uh, you have great Wi-Fi connection, if you have, let's say, 200 questions on that parent form, um, that's going to take a lot longer to upload to the cloud than if you had those 200 questions split into different subforms. So uh, that's just one of the best practices. I try to tell people uh, just for user experience, it's almost better to not to have 100 questions uh, on that parent form. So to try to keep it as minimal as possible and then have subforms um, so that it's a faster upload speed. And the next best practice here is to make sure that you follow form builder golden rules. Well, you're probably thinking, well, what are those form builder golden rules? And here they are. Uh, the first one is to always test before going live. As clear as day with that, um, you just wanna make sure that you're getting uh, what you designed in your form and that your user is not going to run into any problems with uh, any of the JavaScript statements that you put in there. So always make sure that you've tested it. And I would test on multiple devices, again, just to make sure that none of the data is caching and um, that it is working correctly on all devices, not just the one that you've been testing with so far. The second form building golden rule is that uh, the unique data column names, you need to have unique data column names that are database friendly. So when I click here to our reserved word list, uh, this is an article in our help desk, and this just tells you what words you can't have as data column names. And some of these are pretty self-explanatory, uh, but others you may not have thought of. So just definitely come in here and take a look if you're ever wondering. If you were to create a form, and uh, let me actually just open up one of these forms here. And if I were to add a field at the bottom here, I'll just call this location. If I were to now try to save my form, this data column name location is not allowed. So this is the data column name underneath the label. I could keep the label as location, but this is where I'd have to uh, edit this so that it is database friendly. If I were to try to add a new field again, and even though I change it so that the data column name is friendly, I actually won't be able to uh, save this form yet. What's happening is this error message is going to keep popping up until I reload this window. So it's almost in a, a circle. It's going to continue to tell me it's not saving. So to fix this problem and to fix the headache, it's just loading that form and then reopening it. And at that point, I see that that second field that I added for location is still on that form, and it has a data column name that is database friendly. The third 
golden rule here is to make sure that I do not change the input type, data size, or encryption of an element on a live form because it will delete the data. A lot of what's great about iFormBuilder Builder is that you are able to edit a form once it's been to the sent to the field so you can add questions at any time uh, but when it comes to editing a field that was are that already has some data in there that's where you have to be extra careful uh, number one you don't want to change the input type uh, and that's usually what we you know we constantly think about doing changing it from one type of option list to another but that is not uh, that's not what we want to do we actually that will end, have us losing our data so if we do want to change the input type, the data size or encryption, there's just a quick process that we have to do. And uh, let's go with this location example that I have here. So I had this set as a text field. And maybe this is because I didn't realize that there was a location widget available. And I've already captured some data. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to duplicate this input. So now I have two location fields, and in the first one that um, I've already I already have some data in, I'm going to go into the input properties and go to the checkbox that says disabled, and I'm going to disable that field. So when you disable a field, it essentially freezes that that data, so it'll keep that row of data that I previously collected, and it. Now this field will no longer be downloaded to the user's device, uh, but it is still holding the form structure that I originally created. So in the duplicate that I added after the fact, I can then go change the input type to my location widget, and I can change the label to just say location again if I want to, and keep the data column name as location one. So that's how uh, you're able to edit a live form uh, by if you wanted to change the input type or data size or encryption. It's not really changing it. It's just adding a new field and, and um, disabling the one that you previously had in that spot. The new field will have its own row of data. So what you may want to do later on is you may want to compile that data together. Uh, but that's just in the back end and when you're, you're looking at it later. So now we're just going to go into an overview of smart controls. So uh, creating more advanced forms, how, how are you going to do that? Uh, you can add more advanced input types. Uh, these usually require configuration. So like an option list that does have some configuration. There's also our Manity Works, which has the barcode scanning. Um, that takes some configurations. We have our third party and URL scheme, uh, that, which can connect to other uh, apps that you have on your device or launch other apps. So those are some basic, uh, those, those are some of our input types, but you do have some configurations that you have to perform uh, for those different input types, but they do result in better data from your user and a better user experience. So more advanced forms are using smart controls. They will, may also use reference IDs. Uh, if you're capturing location data, instead of, and, and you are parsing out the lat and long in your data set, instead of doing it there, you can actually do it in the form to make it a little bit easier for, for you. You can create segmented option lists, and segmented option lists allow, uh, allow you to almost create this uh, very user-friendly experience where if a user chooses a specific option in option list A, it'll change what they see in option list B. So it's hiding some of those fields, so they don't see things that aren't applicable to their response. These advanced forms will have some built, uh, the iForm Builder built-in functions, and a lot of times they'll also use the smart table search, which pre-populates some form fields for them. So what are they? Uh, our smart controls, they use basic uh, JavaScript, and uh, if you're unfamiliar with JavaScript, do not worry. Our Help Desk article has, articles have so much information on it for you, but uh, not only that, uh, but our agents can always point you into the correct direction with those smart controls. Why use them? Cut down on human error, define what the user sees, as well as cut down on the human interaction with a form, so defaulting as many fields as you can. 
One of the best practices that we had was to make sure that we knew about all the different iForm Builder input types. So what I've done for you here is I've kind of, oh, I've created this uh, table for you to look at all of them. Another note that I'll, I want to make sure that you are aware of is when you're in the form builder and you go to the input types, if you're scrolling through this list, if you ever hover over one of those, it will give you a description on uh, a little hint on what that input type is. And I've included some links for you to take a look at these uh, later on uh, for you to just have as another resource. So when we're in our form builder and we go to our, I'll just jump to this form here because this is what we're going to be demoing later. Uh, if we go into our form builder and go into smart controls, this is where all the magic's happening. Um, you'll notice that you see dynamic value, condition value, dynamic label, but you can also scroll down here and that's where you have client validation and validation message, which those two two smart controls go together. To break it down for you a little bit more, uh, let's go into what each one of these uh, smart control fields are designed to do. The first one is dynamic value. Uh, this is where you're using strict or conditional statements to set a value of the element. The dynamic value is what you'll use most often when you're using the smart controls. The condition value is really where uh, you're, you're focusing on when a, a field should be displayed to a user on their device. So you may have fields in your form that you want hidden from view from the users, but you want it to be populating some sort of information in the background. So that's when you'll use the condition value. Hey, Barry. Yep. I um, just had a question come in. Can you, use, can you use smart controls to make a range slider increments by tens or hundreds? So when you're when you add a range widget to your form, you're able to um, design where what that looks like as far as the minimum and maximum value. To have it go up by hundreds, unfortunately, that's uh, that'll well maybe we can do that, and I just don't know about it. But I'll have to look at it. I think it always has to go up by one, but we'll definitely take a look, and and maybe that is a possibility. Uh, the if you're using the counter widget and you want to change the value that that's into, um, incremented in, that is done with a reference ID, an element reference ID, and that's not done here in the smart controls. So uh, MJ, we'll have to get back to that person about the increment with the range widget. I'm okay. I'm about 55% sure that. Uh, that can't be done with the smart controls, but maybe it's in there and I just haven't tested it out myself. Okay. So uh, going back here, we have our dynamic labels and the dynamic label allows you to change the label of a question for a user in the, in the form. So let's say you have a sub form or let's say you have five questions that based off of what the user chooses from an option list will change a part of that question for those for each uh, of those five questions. So, so what you can do is you can use the dynamic label and then call to that option list and actually have that value populated in the label so that it seems a little bit uh, more personal as well as it's showing the user what they selected previously so it's a little bit more specific than having a, a vague question there. So the client validation and validation message, like I mentioned, those two go together. Uh, your allow, uh, client validation enables you to create a JavaScript statement that restricts a record to be synced to the cloud unless the user meets the criteria that you've placed here. So an example is you tell the user to choose a number between 1 and 10, and they put the number 99 in. Um, what you could have occur is when the user goes to submit that form, they'll receive a message that you placed in the validation message at the bottom here that would say, please revisit question two. I asked you to put in a number between one and 10. This is just another example on what that would look like for this specific uh, screenshot that I have. I asked that a user, the user choose a date in the future and um, if they didn't, then they would receive the error message when they tried to submit the form that says, please enter a future date. Now, one of the best practices that I have here 
is because the user is not going to be seeing this validation message until they try to submit the form, make sure that they know what question they need to go back to to uh, change and uh, edit so that they meet that validation. If it's a very vague validation message, they may not know where to, where to go back to and then they may not even be able to submit that record. Just an example of using the dynamic label. For that example, it was just using a label telling someone thank you for taking the time to fill out the form and then put in their first name. So now I'm going to jump in and give you a review of a form that's rather lengthy, but it does have a lot of these smart controls that we've talked about. And so it'll give you an idea of what can be done and how it appears. Hey, Barrett. Yep. When exporting the data feeds XLS, some names of the subforms are changed to numbers. Why does this occur? When you're looking at it, check to see if you're looking at the subform record ID. So each every record that you submit to the cloud is always going to get a new record ID. And each one of those, if it is a subform, it's going to be tied to a parent form as well. So you're you'll be able to see that relationship and uh, you're looking at the feed, then the subform data column name should never change. At the top of this form, I have two fields for the first name and last name. What I've done here is we have these great iForm Builder built in functions, and these built in functions allow you to populate um, some of the user's information based off of the information that you created when you were uh, creating that user. So this example for our first name, the built-in function is iformbuilder.firstname. And it does matter with the capitalization so that N is a uh, capital there. I then did use the built-in function for last name. And when we talk about these built-in functions, I'll just jump ahead here. Uh, we have a couple different ones. Um, so we have for the user information, we have the username, first name, last name, and email. We can also do subform aggregation where you're uh, tallying up totals from subform records that are completed, and that is iformbuilder.math.sum and iformbuilder.math.average. We can do get next sequence, which allows you to create um, a way to track how many records a user has provided. You can use this and as well as using the built in function for someone's username and you can actually create a unique ID with their username and the get next sequence. Looking at this, I may want it so that I have the person's first and last name together in a field and I'll come back to how to do this in just a little bit. But I, what we're going to do is we're going to concatenate these together so that the first and last name is appears in this field underneath, and I'll, I'll hide these two fields from the user's view. Underneath that, I've defaulted a read-only field so that it's showing today's date and time, so when I first launched the form. I then have a timer widget, and this is if I wanted to track how long it was taking for a user to complete their form, then I could have them started at the very beginning, and it's going to continue to go until they hit the stop button or they submit their record to the cloud. So even when they go into any subforms, it's still uh, timing how long it takes for their, their forms. Then I have the location widget, and in this location widget, I actually have it so that this street address doesn't appear until the user places, uh, uh, captures the location. So if you want it, set it, if you want to set it so that a field does not appear until a user performs an action in another field, what you'll do is um, you'll just do the empty string function that I've included here for location, and beneath that I have it for the condition value because this is again where we're talking about when a field is appearing. I call to that data column name of my location widget which is up here and I do that then do the exclamation point equals quote quote. Again that data column name is underneath where I have the label and I can just copy that and then paste it down there. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to continue going through this form and I'll come back to the form builder side of things in just a little bit. 
So in this work order, I have it set so that BB appears first, and then the user can start typing in any of that work order uh, information that may come in after. They would be able to edit that, but I, at least I put it in there if that is a constant that they have in their form. And that's just by defaulting the text widget to include that. Hey Barrett, can you please show the input type and settings of the tap here at the start of a form? Sure, so that was with our timer widget. And I didn't do any type of smart control with this. This is a, our newest widget that we've added. And uh, all I have here is if I go to the input properties and under input type, I've selected timer. Now we do have a lot more, uh, we do have documentation on using the timer widget. If you wanted to do any kind of calculation with the timer widget, we have that available um, for you. Underneath this, I have um, I have pricing, so I have a basic additional uh, field or addition field. So I'm getting the sum of all these different prices. You'll notice I had it set so, that, and I'll, you'll see here in price four, I had each of these number fields actually defaulted to be set to zero, and that's another best practice that I have. That if you are going to do any kind of calculation or even if you're just having a number field in your form, one of the best things to do is always to default it to zero so that if it caches any of the previous data from some of the other records uh, that the user put in, then by defaulting to zero, it'll always start fresh. Now I've had it so that it has the total at the bottom. Underneath that, I just have two option lists. They're the same ones, but I, whenever I create an option list, if it is a lengthy option list, then I always put other at the very top. The reason that I do that is, especially if you have hundreds and hundreds of questions, uh, the user may not know that other is an available option to them. And so by putting it at the top, they know that they can go through and they can search for a specific option. And if they don't find it, then they can select other. For this workflow, once the user selects other, another field appears for them to type in that other option. So if I go over here, uh, back to my form builder, just to give you an idea, and I know we're getting close to the end of the time here, but we're gonna keep going. Um, in the documentation that I'm going to send over, I, I do have how to default elements in here. I also have it so that uh, the calculations, you can see an example of that. But with the okay. option list, I, I've set, I'm gonna show you it in the form builder, but I have this listed for the steps for you as well. And go okay, ahead, MJ. Yeah, sorry. Um, can you set a default value for a select input type? Yes, you can. So when you're doing option list and um, you're, you're setting option list to specific values, then you're going to use the index value for that option. You can find the index value when you go into the option list and option list manager, and you go to the advanced section. This is where you have all of your index values. In the smart control that I just uh, did to have that other field appear, then I needed to know the number or the index value of zero for other. So that statement looked uh, like the, uh, with the, this is the condition value. I'm calling to the data column name of that pick list, and then I'm putting in as equals equals zero. So that's saying whenever the user selects the option list that value that is has the index of zero, then show this field. Otherwise, keep it hidden. If I had wanted to have it so that I wanted this other field to appear if they selected two different options, then what we, you can do is you can use the or, or you can use a statement that says and. An example of that is, or to show you how to do that, uh, I have on this slide, the two ampersands is saying and, and the two lines uh, are the or. Going back to this sample here, uh, we have a use, I've used an accident code number segmented list. 
So based off of what I select in this first segmented list will change what I see in the second layer. So if I choose one, two, three, four, and I go to that second layer, I see one, two, three, four, A, B, C, D. But if I go back and I select one of those other ones, then I now see those numbers with the A, B, C, D at the end of those. So it changes that view completely depending on what they choose in that first one. I used a smart table search for this. So if I choose one, two, three, four, and then choose one, two, three, four, A, I now have those three fields underneath being populated uh, with data that I have I set in my database. And then I just I I had some additional fields here where I was getting a sum and the average using that subform aggregation. So it's getting those results to display here on the parent form. And I have it so that you can uh, I've set up my third party app to have it text the supervisor or get directions to the headquarters. And the last piece that I had there was I was defaulting the email widget to uh, go, call to the individual who's logged in on their device to display their email. So what I have is we have our overview of smart controls. Again, you're always going to use the data column name. We have a, an area on our page or on our edit form properties page that will allow you to do more advanced functions with our page level JavaScript. These are just some more examples on page level JavaScript if you wanted to get some ideas on what it could be used for. This is how you could default some of your elements here. As I mentioned with the numbers, I usually use the squiggly brackets and then put zero in there um, to default it to zero. Another thing that you can do is instead of defaulting a field to zero, you could always empty the string. So that's clearing out any values that could have been uh, previously collected as well or, or cached. For that individual who was wondering about uh, setting the select option list to, uh, to a specific value, you would use the squiggly brackets and then the index value. And I have that example uh, listed here as well as some other examples uh, for your form on how to definitely uh, just default those fields so that the user's not having to go in and put that information in themselves, and it's already in there. Um, so the next thing that I want to talk about here is, besides using the smart controls to uh, really create those smart forms, we also have element reference IDs, as well as page level reference IDs. In the Art of Form Building, I did talk about the page level, Java, uh, page level reference IDs, and those are located in the edit form properties section. But the element reference IDs are located at the bottom of our element properties in the reference ID section. Now we have a couple different options here uh, for these reference IDs. The top three that I have are for reporting. So if you're using our email or our PDF for your reports, you may want to customize it so that you have some fields that aren't displayed in those PDFs or in those emails. You may also have some questions in your form that you don't want displayed in the Excel files either. So you would use these element reference IDs to uh, decide if those fields are going to be displayed and in what kind of reports will they be displayed in. At the bottom, I've listed four different uh, input types that have reference IDs uh, that go along with them. Uh, the first one is the subform batch mode. So when you have a subform and the user is expected to take multiple records, so maybe you have a subform where they're taking pictures uh, and they're going to take lots of pictures back to back. By using subform batch mode in the reference ID, instead of the user having to go be being brought back to a table edit view or the parent form and then having to create a new record, it's automatically going to create a new record for them. And once they hit the done or submit button, it'll create a new one and keep them in that record window until they have uh, done all the records that they need to. And all they have to do is press the done or back button at that point, and they'll be brought back to the parent form. Two of our newer reference IDs are the photo library disabled and the camera disabled. And those are a configuration so that if you're using the drawing or the image widget, you can define if the user is going to 
have access to the camera or the gallery or photo gallery. By default, they'll be able to access both of those, but you may not want that. And so that's where these reference IDs come into place. The, uh, the last one that we have here is for our counter widget. Uh, if you wanted to change how that counter widget was uh, going up or incrementing, then you can change the value by using this reference ID. So that is all. I wanna thank you all so much for taking the time and uh, energy with me today and going through some of this and enjoy the rest of your day.